Nancy. Um, and this is um, the fifth uh, session of our five part um, webinar series on rapid reviews and scoping reviews. So um, we are coming to the end of our webinar series, but it has really been great um, interacting with you all. Um, I see that there are quite a few people who've been coming to all the sessions repeatedly. So it's great to um, see your names. <laughs> I, I get a sense of familiarity with some of you now. Um, so today's session is um, continuing on from last week's session on scoping reviews, um, but it will be a very practical session today with examples um, on doing um, scoping reviews and the experiences that the review authors have had in doing these scoping reviews. So we've got two presenters. Um, Manya van um, Reinefeld and Anton Dalpont from the School of Public Health. They're both PhD candidates in the school. Um, and like I said, they'll be sharing their experiences of um, conducting reviews, re uh, scoping reviews recently. Um, as you can note, um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, and as usual, we'll send you the ring link to the recording during the week. Um, and as well, um, just to remind you again to please um, send um, your professional council number to um, the host um, by a direct message if you'd like to earn CPD points. Um, and then also just to remind you as well to please um, provide any comments or questions that you have in the chat during the presentations and there'll be an opportunity for discussion at the end. Um, yeah, and I think the last thing that um, we generally do in the webinars is for me to get feedback from you on how you found the webinar, um, whether you have any comments or feedback that can help us um, with planning these webinars um, for future. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm going to hand over to Manya. Um, Manya will start off um, with sharing her experiences with conducting her scoping reviews um, and then. Um, Manya will hand over to Anton, and then at the end, there'll be time for us to respond to questions and for any kind of discussion or comments that you may have. Um, over to you, Manya. Um, cool, thanks. Thanks, B, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um... Yeah, great, you can see it. Okay, let me just get it to the right part. Yeah, we can, can see. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks B, for the opportunity to uh, be here today. Um, so the topic of conversation is really, I guess, one could say personal experiences of being involved in scoping review. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna share um, a bit of my experience and of the process of being involved in the scoping review um, over the course of like 2018 20 to 2019. Um, I wanna just stress up front that I'm not, an expert in um, the in the area, but having gone through the process from start all the way through to publication of the review, um, I have some um, lessons and reflections to share, which I think would be useful for people, um, yeah, doing a similar thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, let me just get started. So. Um, I'm going to briefly just share a background to uh, what the review is about. I won't, I'll avoid going into any deep de detail of the actual content of the review because the emphasis and focus of today is on the process. Um, but I'll give you some background and then I'm just going to go through four elements of the process that I think, um, or that I have reflections to share um, with you about, um, which is uh, the review team. Um, the ways in which we as a team chose to refine the question and our search strategy, um, the experience of searching, cross-searching and collating uh, literature, and then the an analysis and write-up um, of that. 
and then I'll also just finish with um, a few comments on the experience of publication and peer review um, that we had for this particular paper. So uh, the title of um, our review was uh, how can community engagement in health research be strength strengthened for infectious disease outbreaks in sub-Saharan Africa? And we did um, a scoping review of the literature. This was um, just for context. I was doing this as like a research intern just um, immediately after finishing my master's um, in the UK. And this particular review was part of a larger multidisciplinary research consortium um, that was looking at how to build patient-centered clinical research networks um, to respond to epidemics across sub-Saharan Africa. And so the review kind of um, the mandate of this group was to uh, conduct a review um, on community engagement um, and to gather evidence on the ways in which community engagement activities within the context of health research um, are conducted and how they can be strengthened. And obviously this is pre-COVID days and um, at the time, in fact, the major focus of the coalition and of people working in this area at that time was the Ebola outbreak in Western and Central Africa. Um, and that's reflected in, in the literature that we ended up finding. Um, so we, um, I'm just gonna go into the uh, questions. So I think something to stress about what a scoping review is. And I know you've had some background and um, some sessions on this already, so I won't go into too, into too much detail, but um, these were the questions that guided us in um, our uh, scoping review process. And I think they are useful in that they speak to um, what a scoping review actually is. Um, I think this is quite a, a good example of like a typical scoping review question. Um, so we were looking at these quite um, ambiguous and broadly defined concepts. Um, so community engagement, uh, what, what comprises good practice in community engagement, health research is also like, you could argue quite ambiguous. And then we had infectious disease outbreaks and, and sub-Saharan Africa as sort of more specific context. But I wanna just sort of stress here with these questions is um, how, I mean, as with the systematic review, the methodology for searching and collating and reviewing the literature must obviously be rigorous and repeatable. And I'll get more to that process, um, to how we did that in our process later on. But a scoping review in general, I think, is a methodology that allows for reviews to address much broader topics um, where many different study designs can be included. Um, and is less likely to address sort of very specific research questions. Um, and so I think that's captured here in, in um, the questions that, we, that guided us. Um, so just to get into some of the process. So um, of course, uh, I'm sure there are examples of people that do um, scoping reviews on their own, but I was um, quite lucky to be in, as a part of a team um, for this. And I think given the nature of review processes, it can be a lot easier to conduct them in multiple teams as you can delegate the tasks and the, the, the stages of the review across the people. Um, so in this case, um, we were a team of six, um, but it was myself and one other colleague who was a lead author on the paper who really, um, I think, well led the process. Um, the, particular points in the review that really benefit from having one more people um, is particularly the, the screening uh, session sections or stages. And so we had, um, as with um, most reviews, we had two screening stages, an abstract and title screening stage, and then a full text screening stage. Um, and uh, those were processes where uh, myself and Sam, the um, lead author came up with some of, came up with the tools um, and the processes for doing it. But once there was consensus on that, we were then able to give those to other members of the team and have the work shared. Um, and this also allows for a really important element of like cross-checking and helping to mitigate um, bias involved in screening. Um, obviously teamwork has its challenges and um, but we were very lucky in general as a team to work well together. Um, but something, for example, that's really important is 
making sure that they're clear communication channels and um, one place, a shared document in which you document all the different decisions you might be doing on your own um, so that you can keep everybody up to date. Um, and I'll speak more about this a bit later when I get to um, peer review and publication. And then just the final point on making use of library services. Um, we were very lucky, the university um, in the UK that uh, was supporting this review had extensive librarian support um, and a subject librarian attached to our department who was able to spend time with us um, refining our search strategy and also giving us advice on how to find grey literature. Um, and she was also really helpful in helping us actually construct the search. Um, and so if there are those kinds of resources available wherever you are, um, I would strongly recommend making use of them. Um, librarians are trained in this kind of work and, and um, yeah, have a lot of really practical um, knowledge to share. Um, so I'm gonna get into some of the um, kind of nitty gritty of the process here. Um, the, um, so our review had uh, several stages. Um, and in this slide, I'm going to talk more about how we went about refining the questions first, and then what we did um, with our search strategy, which was like a little bit unique in a way. Um, and so first of all, as I mentioned earlier, the review questions, our topic of the review is, um, uh, contain some of these really broad and somewhat ambiguous concepts. Um, in them, things like community engagement, um, effectiveness, uh, health research, and so forth. Um, so in the very early stages of, of coming together and starting this project, um, we spent time, the six of us, the entire team, um, workshopping the definitions of each of the key concepts that made up our question. Um, and we spent almost two days actually together in a room with a big board, um, where we came up with as many synonyms, um, appropriate synonyms as possible to um, capture what it was that we were um, trying, to, trying to review. And um, I'll just show you in the next slide, you can see these were the final search terms that we came up with. Um, and as you can see, there's, yeah, there's like, we had to really put in thought to how to, to trying to cover as much as possible for each of these concepts and making use of the Boolean operators um, in order to do that. And so I thought this was just a useful sh slide to share because it, um, well, first of all, just shows the search terms as they are. And I think that's probably something you've already gone into in the, in the um, program, but uh, yeah, you can see um, even, Sub-Saharan Africa wasn't enough to just kind of chuck that in on its own. We really had to go through every single country if we wanted to capture um, all the literature um, within that context. Um, for the infectious disease kind of section of the concept or of the, of the question, we um, used the WHO like top eight um, infectious diseases um, to keep, out, keep an eye on um, for which there is little to no um, treatment. Um, and, and yeah, other synonyms around community engagement um, and, and um, effectiveness. Um, and so after we had come up with our search parameters, um, and the Boolean operators we wanted to use and the inclusion and exclusion criteria, but we just had two um, exclusion or yeah, we had two criteria um, that uh, it was peer reviewed papers published in English before, I mean, after 1990. Um, we then decided because we had this sort of huge topic, like with these very big concepts um, to conduct a trial search just on one database. And this, um, we chose Scopus to do uh, this trial search using the first initial set of um, search terms that we'd come up with after the workshop. And just to get a feel for what it was that we get, that we get out of the search like that. Um, 
And then we eventually um, changed some of the search terms very, very slightly uh, when we realized that perhaps we were missing certain key synonyms um, for like communicate, community engagement, for example. Um, so we did the trial search first on Scopus, and I'll show you the um, Prisma diagram later where you see how we laid that out. Um, but uh, the trial search was obviously was a bit smaller. And so we, the way we changed the terms meant that then when we did um, the full formal search across all these um, databases, Scohost, Ovid, ProQuest, PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science, um, we, yeah, we had adapted them slightly. And so we got slightly different results. Um, and I, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. Um, and then we also did uh, further down the line, once we had um, already searched and screened, um, we did this process of kind of, they call it backwards, forwards and backwards so citation chasing. So basically of the papers that um, came up in our database searches, we went through their um, reference lists and um, identified any additional papers that hadn't re um, been returned in the search, but that we felt based on their titles um, should be screened as well and included those. Um, just to note, we used Mendeley um, for deduplication and also to um, keep all of our um, references in one place. Um, so I'm just going to show you that. Uh, okay, so um, once we had started, uh, once we had conducted our search, um, um, the first the trial search and then the full search, uh, we then moved over onto a process um, to screen based on abstract and title. Um, we, uh, as I said earlier, the this this part was actually conducted just with three of the six team members, the abstract and title screening process. And we basically did it on Excel. So this was the screening tool that we used. Um, you can see that we just had the references in the left-hand column and then um, we created certain categories to uh, categorize and organize the references and then um, flag them as either yes for inclusion, no for exclusion and unsure for um, basically uh, give it to another person in the team to make, um, to have a conversation. Um, uh, and then um, we did a second round, sorry, I'm trying to understand what I've put in here. Um, yeah, so then we did that second round of screening um, of all of the unsure ones um, by a different author to uh, kind of confirm and come to a, come to a consensus. Um, then we identified some of our core papers, as well as some that none of us could actually agree upon whether they should or shouldn't be included. All of those went to um, the next round of full text screening, which was um, done by five of, five of us. And we just used Word um, to have like a much more in-depth engagement with what, uh, the, what each paper was um, offering. Um, and then, so another really important part of um, this particular topic um, especially because uh, in the end, a lot of the focus of the literature was on Ebola and there was a lot, um, it was obviously a lot being published in peer review journals around Ebola, but there was a lot in the gray literature that hadn't been published in the journals or in the databases that we really wanted to include. Um, and so a, a really important part of this process was um, screening for gray literature. Um, what we did was we consulted quite a wide range of experts um, through the networks um, that this review was being done for, as well as the university. Um, there were a lot of people we could get in touch with who had been involved in um, the trials that came up in the literature review itself. So um, I'll show this a little bit later, but there were uh, six trials that actually ended up forming the bulk of um, the informing the bulk of the papers that we ended up um, reviewing in the review. Um, and so we were able to get in touch with uh, some of those people who had been involved in those trials for further 
uh, grey literature that they might have. Um, we also collaborated with others who were doing similar reviews. So there was a, an ethics and community engagement group at Oxford that was also, um, sorry, in London that was doing a similar thing. And so um, we just happened to connect somehow, I'm not quite sure how, but um, that was really useful because we could share our respective grey literature sources with each other. Um, they were doing a scoping review kind of um, for, a, for a government report. And so, yeah. It was um, that was really useful. And then um, the last thing that we did, which informed a lot of our great literature, was that we conducted um, a workshop in Dakar um, with uh, other members of the alert network. And um, at, in that space, uh, we gathered even more uh, pieces of great literature. These pieces were then, so I'll just show you here. This is a Prisma diagram. Um, so um, the grey literature would be the sort of second from last um, uh, editions of articles that um, we found um, from expert, experts and then also the, the, the reference citation chasing that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this was our Prisma diagram and um, I actually realized that I've copied and pasted the wrong one because there is a slight mistake in this, uh, the eight on the left hand side. Uh, on the right hand side should be a 12. Um, but this was how we, uh, this is the diagram we came up with to um, express the different stages of the, of, the, um, of the review process, including the um, database search, as well as then the initial um, trial search, initial trial search that we did at the very beginning. Um, basically what happened, and this was, this was, this ended up being a really confusing part. Um, and I, I will talk more about the lessons that we learned from this, but um, because the trial search was slightly different, uh, there were sort of 14 missing articles that we felt were relevant, but that didn't come up in the formal, in the formal search across all the databases. And so we had to find a way um, of, of representing and including those 14 um, without sort of messing up what is a fairly standardized process of, of um, moving from one step to the next step to the next step in the review process. Um, and so we, um, we did that, but during the, rev the peer review process of um, publication, it became quite problematic because the way we had originally represented it and explained it in our paper was not clear to the peer reviewer. Um, so, yeah, that was a, a major lesson for us um, and something that we basically just addressed by going back to the meticulous records that we had and really matching all of the numbers. Um, but it was a lesson in, in making sure that that kind of note keeping is done really well, especially when you're working as a team and doing different phases of the review um, by different people and perhaps not communicating all the time. So having all of that information of what you did and what the numbers were laid out in one document is really fundamental to maintaining the rigor of the search. Um, so let me just go on to the next um, step that I wanted to talk to, which was analysis and write-up. So um, yeah, the scoping review, which lends itself well to qualitative analysis. Um, we did, in the end, do a quality appraisal of all of the included um, papers, and um, we sort of used um, three guidelines for quality appraisal and took the relevant um, parts of them. So that was um, critical appraisal skills program, um, and then the confidence and the evidence from reviews of qualitative research, which is circle approach, um, and um, a checklist for critical evaluation of grey literature, which is, um, yeah, it's got another name, this checklist. Anyway, there's tons of um, quality appraisal tools out there, um, depending on what is what type of review you're doing and what is relevant, um, like what's the, the bulk of the um, study designs that are coming into your um, review. And so because most of ours were qualitative papers and also quite a lot of sort of like um, opinion papers or short reports. Um, these were the quality appraisal tools that we decided to use. Um, as I said earlier, the bulk of the core papers came from 
empirical research on community engagement from six trials um, that were conducted during the Ebola, Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. And so even though in our search terms we had included all of these other um, infectious diseases, um, given the context at the time, and perhaps it would have been different if we'd done this research after COVID or, or way before Ebola really dominated um, in, in what the search terms came back um, with. Um, other papers that we included, as I mentioned, were opinions and commentaries. And um, in order to conduct the, well, as, as we kind of went through the iterative process of categorizing and, and um, thematically grouping the papers, um, we basically came up with four categories, um, which allowed us to conduct a, a more deeper analysis and come up with our conclusions and um, findings. And so here you can see um, that we divided the literature into um, four categories. So the first one, on the left is the Ebola trials and trial related papers. Um, and those that's referring to the six trials that came up as the kind of bulk um, of the core papers. And then other papers that fitted into, so were not directly linked to one of these six trials, but was commenting on community engagement in the context of the question we were asking, which is health research for infectious diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. And so those we ended up categorizing within these three um, thematic kind of groups, um, as you can see there. I'm not gonna go into huge detail because as I said, the content of this review isn't really um, the focus for today. Um, I think one thing just to mention, um, which you, you know, depending on the kind of question that you are looking at, sometimes um, scoping reviews on, on questions such as this one um, can be really difficult because, for example, as we found, um, it really became apparent that community engagement activities for clinical trials and health research um, is often not written up as a research activity. Um, so, you know, it's often something that's just done on the side, but is never really the subject of any of the papers or literature that a trial will produce. Um, if it is written up, it's kind of done as part of maybe an evaluative process or, or something like that, but they're often not comprehensive, um, like published papers where the primary goal is to comment on the community engagement activities. So that was a challenge that came up just like and is inherent to the question that we had. And so for analysis, we really just had to gather what was relevant and available from the literature. And I think these three um, themes and then, the, and then the fourth um, category of, of trial specific papers um, reflects um, what we found in the literature. Um, and then just lastly, um, I've got I think a few minutes left, just um, comment on publication and peer review experience. So we did the bulk of the work on this paper between 2018 and 2019, and then only published in early 2021. So the publication, uh, process took a really long time. Um, the review was published in BMC Public Health and we had two anonymous peer reviewers, one who um, thought it was amazing and gave us one round of <laughs> comments and then left us, you know, let, was, was happy with it. And another reviewer who was really, really pedantic um, about the detail and sort of rigor of, the, of how we represented what we did, which in the end um, definitely strengthened the paper, even if it was a bit annoying and tedious at the time. Um, uh, in the end, um, I think we were all super, super grateful to how much time this, this second reviewer um, gave to improving our paper. And so just, um, I guess, to reiterate the major lesson that we had, particularly in terms of um, in court or sort of justifying and explaining the slight um, like weird back and forth thing with the trial search and the and the and then the formal search um, is this idea of like really meticulously documenting the entire review process um, is yeah and um, the number of articles that you searched what um, what happened when you screened how you justified your decisions what was excluded and then what was added. And so, yeah, I think just to say like in a scoping review, it's it's doable and feasible to have a sort of more iterative stage of searching. Um, I think that's, that's what makes the scoping review um, really useful and also um, um, 
amenable to qualitative research in particular and qualitative analysis in particular, but to balance that out and stay true to the sort of systematic nature of what these reviews are hoping to do, um, this documenting of the process is really important. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. Those are just the two um, references um, from the presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you. Thank you, Manya. Um, I was going to let um, Anton go next, but I actually think that some of the questions that are being asked are quite specific to your um, scoping review. So I think maybe we can go to those and if there are any general questions, we can leave those for later. Um, one of the questions um, that Professor Leach asked was, why did you do a scoping review specifically? And I guess that's around your, uh, your specific objectives that you had. Um, why did you opt for this type of review versus another type of review? Maybe you could start with that one. Okay. Um, so I think what we were looking for was a framework that uh, was flexible enough. So there was, um, some talk of doing kind of like a rapid review, um, uh, a realist review, sorry, and um, and a systematic review. But I think given the ambiguity of the question um, and the need, especially after we did the trial search and saw kind of what was coming back, um, realizing this thing of like, there not being that much in terms of um, sort of focused, uh, peer-reviewed publications on this specific question, but that in fact a lot of the literature and the evidence around this question is embedded in other forms of um, either commentaries or as sort of subsections within uh, other papers where the main focus is commenting on the study um, outcomes. Um, we felt like a scoping review framework which which kind of has gives some room for that flexibility and for inclusion of broader um, concepts and inclusion of multiple different study designs uh, was like the best option for us. So that's what um, motivated the choice. Mm, yeah, thanks, Manya. That um, really helps. Um, and then I was just wondering when you were going through um, this sort of iterative approach um, for your search strategy, I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit around sort of the motivations for that. and. Also, when did you, what made you feel comfortable that your search strategy was ready and you could do the search and you could actually start the review, given that you had to go through several processes of actually doing that iteration to get the search um, to a point where you felt comfortable with it? Sure. Yeah, so um, I guess the, the answer to that is sort of twofold. On the one hand, we were doing this review as part of a work package on like um, understanding how health research and the public health response during an outbreak um, uh, are contingent upon each other and um, how to understand and address sort of impact of health research within the context of like ongoing outbreaks. Um, and so we, we um in kind of that that i guess you could call that the sort of mandate or whatever that we were given and so and and then as we interpreted that ourselves through the process of the workshop we we really had to give a lot of thought to um how to translate that and there were some people on the team um for example professor vicky marsh she is and and professor shelley lease they are both sort of really like experts in that field of ethics, um, research ethics, community engagement, and those kinds of things. So they really helped in that first process um, uh, to, to narrow down our thinking um, to some of the, to these core concepts that made up the research quest, I mean, the review question. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the trial search in a way is kind of emblematic of, of the tentative feeling we had, you know, that we weren't so certain. And so in doing a trial search, we were um, feeling it out, um, seeing what might come back. We had really no idea what would come back. For example, we weren't expecting 
the um, literature to focus as much as it did on Ebola. We thought that by including all of these other diseases, we'd get other stuff, but it mm. is just reflective of what is out there in terms of the literature that the Ebola stuff completely dominated. Um, and mm. as I said in my presentation, that if we'd done this at a different time, it would have obviously looked quite different. Um, and then, sorry. Um, so yeah, I think, it, eventually it was kind of just um, that process of doing the workshop and then also getting the getting a little bit of a go-ahead in a way from the librarian that we worked with um, and she looked at our search terms and compared it to our question and was like yeah I think this is fine mm -hmm. you guys are good to go um, and then at a certain stage we just had to get on with it and hope <laughs> hope for the best <laughs> yeah 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 um, so you we you searched quite a few databases. Um, do you think what do you think are sort of the strengths or limitations with doing that? I mean, I think sometimes with the scoping review, given that it's so broad and you can find so much, um, sometimes I mean I know that I make this suggestion often that maybe stick to a few databases, three or so. Mm -hmm. Um, but you guys did quite a lot and grey literature and contacted experts, etc. What do yeah. you think was the benefits or disadvantages with doing that? That's a really good question. I mean, obviously, that is completely content, like dependent upon the kind of question you're asking. And I think when we realized sort of how marginalized this question of community engagement within health research is, I mean, we're talking about big pharmaceutical vaccine trials here and like now it seems obvious that like with the vaccine the COVID vaccine trial it seems obvious that community engagement is a big part but kind of power dynamics the focus on ethics and all of these things that um politics and things that happened during the Ebola epidemic in particular in the way that some of those trials were run it meant that community engagement as a topic was really neglected and marginalized um in the literature and I guess that's a whole other conversation that we can have but I mean the fact is that we were really like struggling to find um stuff for the review and so the emphasis on grey literature was also um something that came about as a response to the fact that so much of the writing around community engagement is not formal published um papers based on sort of a study design but it comes out in these kind of more um, yeah, like different spaces, the grey literature, commentary and opinion pieces and that kind of stuff. And so I think, I mean, in the end, the number of databases, um, we could have probably gotten away with a, f a few less um, mm -hmm. and increased our emphasis on, on the grey literature. I think for us, the grey literature ended up being like, yeah, really, really important for our specific question. Um, but I'd say the number of databases yeah, I think it's definitely a balance between being pragmatic with whatever your question is and the time frame you have um, and the resources you have and um, and and then balancing that with um, the potential that you might get more if you search more databases. Mm, yeah. Um, your review was quite comprehensive, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Just in terms of what you included. And yeah, I think it's also the topic, right? Because I think your topic, you you find actually a lot of valuable content, um, not in databases from the great mm -hmm. literature. Um, yeah, totally. And I think and I because think... it's also around sort of community engagement and ethics around that, I think including non sort of published literature somewhat is also the ethical thing to do given the topic area. Exactly, um, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, what I also thought was quite interesting from um, your scoping review um, compared to others is that you did quality appraisal. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit to why you decided to do quality appraisal? Generally, I mean, it is acceptable to do a scoping review and not do quality mm -hmm. appraisal. Um, mm -hmm. I think last week I was actually saying that I hadn't seen a scoping review where, they, where, where they've done quality appraisal. Um, and yeah, of course, yours does this. So maybe just speak to that a little bit. Sure. So um, I think again, the quality appraisal speaks to the to um, the vagueness of the literature that was returned in the search. Um, and so because we were dealing with like such a wide variety of um, sorry of papers um, from um, 
government reports to um, research, um, trial reports and sort of like supplementary data from the trials to a few published peer reviewed published studies, and then also a lot of like commentaries and opinion pieces. Um, I think we were worried um, that there would be a pushback against the findings if we didn't include some kind of quality appraisal step. Um, and so we, I, I think you're right, it is quite unusual. Um, and I think for us, it was kind of like the vastness of the review so that it is as comprehensive as it is, but also that it's including so many different types of um, literature um, within it, we felt like quality appraisal exercise was would just kind of increase the legitimacy and the rigor um, of the process. Um, and so we, and, and but then also because we had these different kinds of papers included in the study, we had to use multiple tools because not all of them applied to all of the kinds of papers. And I saw there was a question, um, the names of the quality appraisal tools in the chat. I can copy and paste that in here, but also it's all in the paper if you just, um, if, you, if that's open access as well. So if you want to get a more in-depth thing, but I can copy and paste them in the chat. Yeah, well. I think that would be helpful, Manya. And maybe just also just copy and paste the link to your actual paper in the chat. Sure. Um, that would be also really helpful. Um, yeah, I think let's move on to Anton's presentation. Um, oh, there was one last question. Um, sorry, and then we'll move on to Anton's, which is um, why did you eventually in uh, oh, no, did you eventually include the 14 missing articles in the scoping review? Some of the detail on that would be helpful. Yeah, um, I mean, very quickly, yeah, we did. Um, it's also explained in the paper if you want to read that through. Um, and uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was just, there ended up being um, 17 papers from the trial search that we wanted to include of those 17. Um, three of them had already came, came up on other databases when we did the second search, but there were 14 that were missing. And that was because of the slight tweaks that we did. And to be honest, like completely honest, and maybe this sounds foolish, but I still don't really understand why they didn't come up in the second. We, we really tried to figure that out. And I don't know if it was like database playing tricks with us or Mendeley playing tricks with us or what it was. I can't really wrap my head around why they wouldn't have come up in the formal search but yeah we did include them because having read them we felt like they were relevant to our question and not including them would have been silly yeah sometimes it happens i think with you know in indexing and on on the databases themselves and mm. yeah when studies were published or added to the database also matters um thanks manya um that's really helpful i think um to everyone um anton um i'll hand over to you and then um like with manya um it, it would be good to just add questions for anton in the chat um and then we'll give anton an opportunity to respond at the end over to you anton Uh, thank you, P. Um, and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen here. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. And uh, thank you, Manuel, for sharing your journey with us and highlighting many key points and challenges. Um, and thank you, B, for offering me this opportunity to share my experiences around brainstorming and developing my scoping review. Um, and how this eventually played out practically when I started my actual review. And a little disclaimer, I'm still in the process of conducting my scoping review. Um, and I'm currently reviewing my titles and abstracts. So I can't, cannot give any actual feedback on engagement beyond this stage though. I've also written this and submitted a protocol paper for this scoping review, um, which I found now when starting with the write-up of my own work um, that is kind of pros and cons to that. Um, pros being writing a protocol paper and submitting it, you uh, you outline your plans more clearly um, and you can, but when you write up now where I am, I have to paraphrase everything I said, so that's taking a bit of time. But I actually received feedback from my editors yesterday, um, which then gave me a moment to reflect on their feedback and also tweak my presentation to include the reviewer suggestions. 
Um, so with that being said, let me just share my journey with you. There you go. So some background to my study uh, and for context around my review question. My field of interest is located in HIV research uh, with a specific interest in antiretroviral medication adherence or antiretroviral therapy adherence. Um, my study focuses on the barriers to adherence, specifically um, barriers such as substance use and violence. Um, and these two factors occur fairly often um, concurrently among people living with HIV, and there's an actual term for this phenomena. It's, they're referred to as the SABAS endemic, SABAS standing for substance abuse, violence, and HIV AIDS. Um, and additional barriers, as highlighted in much literature, violence and substance use or abuse often goes hand in hand with mood disorders, um, with the most common being depression and anxiety. Um, so now this is, is fairly broad, um, well, it's massive, and it's a massive field with tons of literature. And I can tell you now, uh, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into, but that's one of the strengths of scoping reviews is its flexibility, um, the iterative nature of scoping reviews so that you can go back and adapt your, or refine your review approach. But my intention is to, and just to give you some context of a scoping review is the first step uh, but scoping is the first step or stage that I'm busy with. I'm involved in a, in a project where we are monitoring ART adherence behavior, including taking viral loads or um, not taking viral loads, following up on viral loads. Um, so I will use the data from this project to present uh, data on ART adherence in Cape Town from this project. But the scoping review um, is laying the foundation for the rest of my study, for the rest of my PhD. Okay, so formulating my review question, the JBI or Joanna Briggs Institute, I'm not sure if you, if the JBI has been mentioned at some point during the webinar, so I won't go into details, but the JBI is, uh, or I always want to say, um, a mandatory resource for when you are conducting scoping reviews. Um, and you, can go, um, you can go read up on the, on the JBI's website, but the JBI presents the PCC framework. Uh, or population concepts and context framework. Um, this is similar to PICO or PO or other approaches when conducting literature reviews, but the scoping reviews, the JBI recommends the PCC approach. And as you can see here, um, my population is people living with HIV. Concepts refer to my specific scope of interest, meaning adherence, substance use, violence, cyber and mood disorders. In my context, I initially had Sub-Saharan Africa as um, Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa as by far the highest prevalence, HIV prevalence. Um, however, I actually spoke to with B a while back and she suggested that I change my context to lower middle income countries. Um, and that's again, it's a nice part of the scope of movies. You go back and you find your study as you go along. Um, and writing out the PCC criteria might seem like I did here might seem like a bit of a waste of time, but I, I have gone back to this table and changed my concepts a few times. Um, and it's just good to see it and refresh your mind. Um, so building on from my PCC criteria, um, and as stated by O'Malley in the back, it all, your research question should be clearly stated in the title. Title. So I followed the guidelines set up by JBI and I came up with this review question. What is the impact of concurrent occurring service endemic anxiety and depression on ART adherence behavior among people living with HIV and LMICs? Also keep in mind this question have changed a few times. So I have refined it, um, but this as it stands is its final form. Um, and I adapted the title of my review to coincide with this, the co-occurrence of mood disorders and the service endemic as barriers to antiretroviral therapy adherence among lower middle income countries. Um, so just to provide some context, further context, the aim of my study is to explore literature reporting on substance use, violence, anxiety, and depression among people living with HIV and LMICs and then map these outcomes thematically as barriers to ART adherence behavior. 
Um, and with the objectives, uh, it is very important, at least in my experience, it is very important to come back to one's objectives when screening titles and abstracts. And I'll tell you why um, for myself and hopefully others too, so that I'm not the only one. Um, is it always possible to work on your on your study or your research every day? And what happened to me while title screening, I thought I knew what I needed to look out for with my title and abstract screening. I had the PCC criteria in my head and based on this, I thought I'm good to go. But after reviewing what felt like a thousand titles, fortunately it wasn't, but I went over my objectives and just to make sure that I'm on the right track and then everything looked fine, except I saw that I have a prevalence objective, which I did not take into account while screening titles. So I had to go back and rescreen titles, which I already screened. And my point is, um, don't risk your time because you think you're on the right track. Go back to your aimed objectives and just review your questions. Um, make sure that you're in line with the study. And I think my confusion regarding my objectives was born out of constantly refining my objectives as I went along. I updated my objectives and during my preliminary view of articles and after that I think at some point my brain was just in complete denial of any new changes made and it stuck to my old objectives. But, uh, but the, the, what I want to highlight here from my objectives is um, everything here refers to the Savas endemic and I'll, I'll speak to that why that's important. Um, identify the prevalence of Savas endemic, map the coexistence of Savas endemic, explore the impact of Savas endemic and explore the impact of the combination of Savas and depression and anxiety on AOT adherence. Now this, once I finalized my aim and objectives, I sat with a new headache, all right? Because I've just mentioned Savas, my interest is much around the service endemic. How do I approach this when developing my research string or my Boolean search string? Um, if I search for service endemic related articles or only SAVA in a title, I will miss out on other articles that may speak to violence and HIV without the mention of substance use. Or alternatively, um, I'll find articles that speak only to substance use and HIV and does not mention violence. So, the same could be said about mood disorders, substance use, and HIV, uh, or violence. Um, so I opted to include all the terms, banking on the idea that I will refine my searches as I go along, which fortunately worked out for me. Um, so aside from hoping my refining would lead to easier search terms, we opted to address these challenges with a couple of secondary review questions. Um, and you see here now I've, I've changed from only mentioning SAVA to include the other factors. Um, for example, how prevalent is violence, substance use, or the SAVA endemic among people living with HIV? Uh, what is the impact of violence, substance use, or the SAVA endemic? How prevalent is depression and anxiety among people living with HIV? What is the impact of depression? and anxiety on AOT adherence, and how prevalent is the co-occurrence of violence, substance use, or the service endemic and depression among people living um, with HIV who are AOT adherent. The idea is, or it was, um, was to address my objectives, which felt a bit overwhelming, but by breaking it up into more manageable chunks in the form of these secondary questions. Um, and it definitely did ease my approach to screening titles. Um, and before I start hammering away on my Boolean search string, uh, I had to identify databases that I will access. And with the help of our faculty librarian, um, we identified these databases. And mind you, this is by no means the only databases. These were the ones that I have access to by the university's library. Um, I certainly don't think that I needed to use so many databases, um, but the argument at the time was that there will be much overlap between these databases and after duplicate uh, removal of duplicate articles, I should be left with a decent amount of relative literature. And looking back, I would not endeavor to go this broad on databases again. Um, and I'm by no means an expert when it comes to literature reviews, but unless you have a big team to assist you, I would suggest maybe look at fewer databases. Um, and regarding the limiters, these were the limiters selected on each database and not 
should not be confused with my eligibility criteria. So these are ones I just selected on the, on the databases. So how did I finalize my databases and my Boolean search string? Um, I apologize for how small everything looks. I started by searching individual content, concepts. For example, I'm not sure if my mouse is, you can see my mouse, but at the top left, um, I typed HIV or AIDS, and then saw how many results yielded on each database. So you can see the top academic search complete, uh, psych, psych article, Sinal, Eric Miller, and I documented these as I went along. And I did this for each of our main concepts listed under my PCC framework. And then with the assistance of the faculty librarian, I looked at each concept as a subject on each database. Um, this helped me identify what terms were used by other researchers using that database, or what terms to add to my concepts of interest. So for example, my one concept is violence, but when I look, looked at subject specific searches across databases, terms such as interpersonal violence, um, domestic violence, uh, what is uh, exposure to violence, gender-based violence, these um, came up. So those are the, what this means is when people are searching for, for, ex look, for example, if their literature review is looking at um, violence, these subject terms are typically what they add to their searches. So by doing this, I basically stole other people's ideas, combine it together. Um, so by combining these concepts with subject terms, I ended up building a massive search stream whilst keeping, whilst keeping track of the number of results per database. And with this, I was able to tailor my final search stream accordingly um, to yield a better or optimal um, result based on these database specific results. And as you can see here, highlighted in red, this was just for me, uh, means it was less than 20 hits, gold is less than 250 hits, and gray was zero. However, if you look at this chart, um, in the second one uh, here, you will notice, we well, can't really tell because everything's a bit small, but what was strange to me was that a database such as APA Psych articles yielded so few results. And I was thankful, and this is a lesson I learned, and, I'm very thankful for it. At first, I was a bit confused because if I'm searching for mood disorders, surely APA psych articles database would yield the most results, right? So then, so the lesson this exercise taught me was that databases can be fairly finicky and a search string that works on one database may not necessarily work on another database. Um, so my advice, and again, I'm no expert, this is purely my experience, I would rather avoid meta databases unless you're a pro at navigating databases. And for those um, who are unfamiliar with what a meta database is, um, it serves as a search engine, I'm making quotation marks. It's a search engine where you can add your identified or selected databases together and search across these databases using one search engine. For example, um, APA Psych Articles is a database, Sinal is a database, and Eric is a, Sinal, is a database. And these can be added to the meta database EBSCOs, which means you only have to type in your search, um, your Boolean search stream once on EBSCOs, and this will search them across the databases you've added. Um, but this is what I learned. For example, here you have a search string with, without ditto marks or quotation marks, no, no brackets, nothing. And you can see the results are 3,353. Now, um, by adding ditto marks to the same search string, my yield changes to 3,315, which argumentatively is not much, um, then it's probably a more refined result. But when I add brackets, my results turn to three. So you can see that for some databases, you require parentheses and others not. Um, some want ditto marks and others not. So uh, friendly caution, first check the search criteria of your database before dumping all the databases together in a meta database. Um, because if I, 
ran my search, as you can see here um, with this, my, the searches under the second column, APA psych articles, is, is very poor compared to the rest. And that's because I ran, this is not, this is the old um, table that I have, a new one's updated, but this was just a practical example. Um, so uh, coming back to my, to finalizing my search screen, um, after adding my subject specific terms and running iterations of searches, I ended up with a fairly big search screen that was very inclusive. And as you can see here, um, I either got way too many hits or depressingly little. But you also, if you you'll see that the results are based on whether or not I use parentheses. So this, this was quite a challenge to me and I was like, okay, how am I going to deal with this? Um, especially because there's so many databases. Well, I had to run multiple iterations, which <laughs> it looked like this. Now I would advise you if you're doing this alone, this process will seriously make you question or reevaluate your approach to life. It was rough, but at the end of the day, I had a pretty good idea about what I'm dealing with. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize again for it being so small. There will be a bit of a bigger one after this. Um, I ran iterations and documented different search strings across all of my databases just to see which databases are best. Plus this exercise helped me refine my search stream. And if you are wondering why the colors I added notes to myself regarding how good the yields were, and, um, and that's just because I would never be able to remember uh, the, the quality of results per database. And also as a disclaimer, um, the notes I left myself was based on the first two pages of results when I ran the search, not just by the number of results. For example, if when I ran a search and it showed 2000 hits, I didn't see, okay, 2000 hits, great, that looks good, let's keep the database. I would scroll through uh, the two, first two to three pages just to get an idea. Um, and doing that on the database may not be true reflection of the rest of the, the yields of the database, especially if you have over 2000 hits, but I had to do it this way in order to retain at least my own sanity. Um, so here's an example of some of my identified databases and search strings. Um, the tabs colored red. Again, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but you'll see in the first grouping, um, there's red. And then these are the databases that I identified um, using those specific search strings. And you'll see I have different framing of my search um, screen. And for these instances, the brackets are moved, the parentheses are moved. And um, for example, in the second one, I have, uh, let me just, sorry. I added, um, let me just see uh, the substance. I, uh, what did I do here? In the first one, I added, added ART adherence to both um, parentheses, one with HIV abuse, and then the second one is depression. I added ART there. In the second one, I added the ART at the end, at the last parentheses. And then the first one I added, uh, the third search string I added under the first bracket. I know this sounds a bit all over the place. But these were three of my search strings and I have more. And I ended up with having different search strings for different databases. And then having also to look at titles or choose abstracts or all text. Um, and this is where I'm currently at. After telling my results, I ended up with just over 13,000 hits. Um, also, sorry, B, if this has been mentioned, but um, once you get to this point, you need to decide how you're going to manage your results. And I know, um, uh, Manya, you mentioned Mendeley. I also use Mendeley um, purely because it's free. But you can also use, for example, EndNote, um, which is not free. Uh, we can get, uh, yeah, you can get a free tri month trial if you sign up. If you, I mean, I've done other projects where you just sign up for a month, you review people's titles, and then you don't need it anymore. But my point is, these, these software programs allow you to export your results from your databases and import it to your desktop, and will also remove um, the duplicate titles. Um, which saves you quite a lot of time. 
and also uh, I would strongly advise Mendeley or EndNote just in general because it will help you with your referencing. But also mind you, these programs aren't perfect. Um, every now and then I come across a duplicate title. But just to give you some perspective of the 13,000 titles I identified, after exporting them to Mendeley, I, and I was left with just over 9,000. So it saved me a fair amount of time. And also, um, uh, although 9,000 titles might seem daunting, daunting um, a lot of it is irrelevant. For example, under my biggest database, APA Psych Articles, I have uh, 3,000 hits. But many is because I search for ART in terms of antiretroviral therapy, while the databases literally spew out hundreds of studies looking at art, uh, the craft, uh, as a therapeutic measure to treat mood disorder. So there's a lot of overlap between the databases. There's a lot of um, things that I know I won't be using because other databases are also so art. So it will take time, but I'm not too concerned about that. And then reflecting on the process, and don't be wrong, every time I speak to my, with my supervisor, I feel like I should have added something. But what I learned, it was important for me to understand during um, this developmenting, developing stage was at some point you need to stop. Um, you saw how I did iterations and I went across databases. I spent a lot of time trying to be as inclusive and clever as I possibly can with my search string and my databases. But the fact is, for as long as you're going to tinker with your strings and your searches, your results will always change. And at some point, you need to just step back and say, this is what I'm going to do, going to work with. Because I promise you, if my supervisor did not say, Anton, that's enough, I would still be busy tinkering. That is where I'm at currently. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for sticking it out through my presentation. It was an interesting process for me to go back to the beginning and document as well as reflecting uh, on my journey to this point. And I wish all of you the best with your future scoping use. Thank you again, and over to you, B. Thank you, Anton. Um, there were some comments. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Catherine was just um, relating to the aspect of rescreening um, and trying to align um, your screening, your, um, your strategy, I guess, with the aims and the objectives of your review. Um, and then there was a question about duplication. So did you come across um, duplication um, when you searched in the different databases and how did you manage that? Yes, um, certainly. Uh, I'm just sorry, I can just share this again with you, um, especially these databases. Uh, so you have Medline, Medline, and Medline through PubMed and Medline through EBSCOhost. Um, my results on both of them were different. I think the one I got a couple of thousand, and the other one I got a couple of hundred. And within that, there was overlap. And a lot of Medline is also the articles comes across in, I think it was a web of science. So yeah, across databases, there were many duplicates um, and even within databases, I found some duplicates. But yeah, that, that I just, majority of that, I Mendeley just removed for me. And then like I come, if I come across one, I would just remove it. Mm, yeah. Um, are there, other questions or comments for Anton? So Anton, you've, you've now done your search, right? And yeah. have you started screening? Yes, I started screening and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I, went, I, got to, I went through a couple of, uh, probably a few hundred articles, it was less than a thousand, then I realized um, my objective is highlighting prevalence. So I had to go back and start over. But yeah, uh, I've got a good couple of thousand articles left. And if anyone feels like joining, they're more than welcome. Yeah, thanks, um, Anton. Okay, um, I don't see any 
other questions or comments? Um, uh, Catherine is asking whether you have a second reviewer. I had one. Um, she unfortunately has quite a lot of work now. So I had I had a I had my reviewer, but in between the time I had to get sidetracked with other projects and things. And that interim, that person had to, that was their free time. And now they 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 don't have time anymore. So now I'm currently just doing this on my own until I can find someone. But I'm hoping to ask a master student or an honor student to to assist. Yeah. Um, I think it would also be, I mean, I think this is a great opportunity as well to network with colleagues. So if there are people who are working on the same content area or would be interested to kind of um, exchange tasks, if someone else is doing a scoping review, for example, that you could be involved in or vice versa, I think that would also be a great opportunity for that here. Um, yeah, so I think you can you can always sort of um, express any kind of interest in the chat. Um, there's a question I think for all of us um, around um, the range of studies. So question is from Dan. He's asking with a wide range of studies that can be included in scoping reviews, how can we synthesize across different types of studies? Um, Manya, I think you may you may have this similar experience. Um, but what usually happens in the context of scope of scoping reviews um, is that you, if you are looking at, for example, specific concepts, or if you are looking at specific definitions, or whatever the aspect is that you are looking at, um, you would you would generally it's recommended for you to synthesize by your objectives according to your objectives rather than according to the different study designs. You're not going to produce something like, for example, a meta-analysis because you will have both qualitative mixed method and quantitative studies. And you're not interested in the study design per se, you're interested in the particular concept that is that you're looking at within your objectives. So if you are, for example, looking at how people define community engagement in the different studies, it doesn't matter whether the study is qualitative or quantitative in nature. Um, it's about bringing those key concepts together and um, trying to synthesize them. So how you do it is it's quite a, I mean it's quite a process. Uh, so if you're if there are aspects to what you're looking at that is numerical, you would uh, most likely choose to use base, uh, basic descriptive statistics um, because the within the scope of a, of this type of of review, you would be looking at things like the average or the frequency of things or the, the, the averages of things rather than actually trying to look at the effectiveness of things, for example. So with that, it would be purely descriptive kind of methods for synthesizing. And the same kind of applies with um, qualitative approaches. Um, you would choose to use something like a framework. Some people do use frameworks to guide the qualitative findings that they find within the scoping review, but you may also just uh, choose to do sort of basic thematic coding analysis. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's, it's quite broad and quite um, often very descriptive. So you aren't doing very complicated kind of analyses um, with the results that you typically expect to get from a scoping review. Um, Manya, do you want to maybe just briefly summarize how you guys in your scoping review did the analyses? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd agree um, with everything you've just said, B. and obviously our review was qualitative only. Um, I have no quantitative background, so I would have been quite... Um, um, at sea in terms of quantitative synthesis. But um, for our paper, we basically, um, well, I guess that table that I showed in initially, which had sort of, we, we of the papers that we had, where there were papers that were um, directly linked to the six trials, we categorized them um, as a sort of set of core papers um, that helped us to identify, I guess, something of a conceptual framework. Um, and then 
the remaining papers, um, we, I guess, I mean, we actually, we used a thematic based um, content analysis really uh, to code those and, um, and come up with the, the three themes that then allowed us to analyze, um, to categorize and analyze those according to themes. Um, so yeah, I, that's what we did. Thanks, Manya. Um, was there another question? So I think the one thing that Catherine and both Anton spoke about is the aspect of um, trying to get a second review and how challenging that can be, especially if you are doing um, this, a scoping review for your thesis um, and you don't necessarily have a lot of funding to hire or recruit people to work with you on the review. Um, I think in this situation, one of the things I always suggest is that if as a first reviewer, you can do quite a lot of um, the work yourself, but it's still advisable if you do have a person who maybe has very limited time to work on your review for you to rather um, ask that person to spend time um, working on checking this, the different stages of what you're doing. So for example, with um, your full text screening, you'd maybe you would have selected specific studies into your review, but getting someone else as a second reviewer to review maybe 20% of the studies of the full text that you've included to just check um, what you've done. Same as with data extraction, if you've extracted a few studies, getting someone else to look at um, a sample of those to check. And I think there's also the, the, the second aspect of being able to actually brainstorm and discuss this with your supervisor or supervisors. Um, especially just for them to be able to kind of see that you followed a somewhat rigorous um, process, even if you maybe don't have a second uh, reviewer who will do everything in duplicate with you. Um, and I think it's a great idea actually, especially amongst students to, to exchange time, um, to volunteer, to work on someone else's review as the second reviewer or just sort of a quality checker. And, and that person then being able to work on your review to do the same thing. Um, that's also like one way of negotiating how you can actually find that second reviewer person. Um, yeah, and um, I think there are no other questions or comments. Um, this is our last session. Um, thank you everyone for always participating and giving comments and asking questions. Um, it's really been wonderful. Um, I've put a link to the evaluation form. It would be really wonderful if you could um, provide us with feedback. We will send um, the recording link as per usual. Please do let us know if you haven't received um, any of the recordings from any of the sessions that you would have wanted to receive the recordings from um, so that we do send it to you. I think what we'll also do as a next step is to make sure that we upload the links um, um, on our website so that it's also quite um, uh, visible for you to have one sort of a, a, a one page summary of the five different sessions and where the recordings are. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any, there doesn't seem to be any last comments, questions. Thank you so much, Manya and Anton, and also to Zianda, who's always here um, helping me with um, admitting everyone in any kind of technical support and doing the Mentimeters with me. Um, I really do appreciate your time, Zianda, and um, everyone for attending. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.